We're talking Ice Boss on today's episode of the Students of Stores podcast, sponsored by Gansett Wraps. Welcome back, everybody. Happy Sunday. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Noam Watt, and today I'm joined by Mike Mavridakis, a writer at the Daily Campus who covered the UConn men's hockey team this season, and Danny Barletta, a double agent for the DC, as well as UCTV, who also covered the team this year. Thanks for joining me today, guys. Hope you're both hanging in there, doing all right. Yeah, no, yeah. Happy, to, happy to be on. So, happy to be on. So today we're going to be talking UConn men's hockey, and there's a lot to talk about. This was one of their best seasons in recent memory. Fortunately, as we'll get to, obviously, it was cut short due to the coronavirus. But first things first, Danny, we'll start with you. Give me a short recap of this season. Well, for me, um, this was uh, this was a great team to cover. Most, most fun I've had covering a team. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, they really, it was just, it, it was just a really good team to watch throughout the season because they consistently improved throughout the year. You know, they they started off kind of slow. Then they hit their peak at, at the right time, and you just you got the feeling, especially toward the end of the season, with those couple of crazy comeback wins in the last minute. You know, you, you got the feeling that this team was destined for something special. Like, did they have the record that BC had? No. Were they in you know the top twenty rankings? No. But like, you, you just got the feeling that this team had something special in its future. And of course, it's just a shame for for all the athletes of, of every sport that got canceled. But, you know, especially with a team like UConn Hockey this year that really you got the feeling that they had unfinished business to do. So I had a great time covering it with uh, Mike and, and Connor. And, uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a really fun season. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, they really had a great season this year. But, unfortunately, they were a bit streaky at times. They'd go games, three or four games, kind of struggle to get out of the gate and just they like, can't really – uh, get over it and then there are other times when they go run off a six to even nine game stretch where they just blaze through everybody uh, but they really just couldn't stay consistent and then of course the, the season gets cut short by coronavirus but I think this team really showed that uh, they have some potential going forward and that if they uh, decide to play every day with their full effort they can really do something and the seniors really the seniors that are going out are uh, really show that or gave them a strong base to, to improve on uh, as we go forward. So you guys really both made some interesting points there. I think the big takeaway is that it was a lot of fun. I mean, it's a team that really came together as the season went on. But in order to get to that point where they came together, it meant that there needed to be a turning point somewhere because, quite frankly, they started off the season not hot. Um, pretty much up to the start of the new year, they were sub-500 team, not really winning games they needed to win struggling to get off to good starts, like you said, Mike. But eventually, they figured things out. Now, I want to ask each of you, Danny, I'll start with you again. What was your tor- your turning point for this team this season? It could be a game. It could be a stretch of games. It could even be just one specific play. But I want to hear both of your turning points for this 2019-2020 season. Yeah, for, for me, I feel like there was almost uh, two turning points of the season. Like the, the first one is the BC series early on. Now, they really just bottomed out. Like that was – the low point you talked to the the coach the players throughout the season they pointed to that series where they were like we got to get our our crap together and uh you know because that that was ugly they were blown out 11 to 1 in two games but they actually did really well the rest of the first half after that they went 5 1 and 2 in their next eight games to close out the first half of the season but it wasn't i i can't say that was just the only turning point because then right after the um right after the the break they, they went on another losing streak. They lost four straight. They tied um, St. Lawrence, who's one of the worst teams in the country. They should have easily won that game. They, they tied that one. So, um, you know, it, it, they were in another rough patch. But then they went on that incredible run in, in conference play uh, where they went 9-1 and one in the next 10 to really give themselves an opportunity to host, which was the, the team's goal at the beginning of the season. So I, I feel like that final turning point was, you know, I think it was a game versus Maine in Bridgeport uh, that started that winning streak. And they, uh, you know, they kind of stole that game with a comeback. And then uh, the rest of the season was uh, was history. So the, the, that, that was what I would say was kind of the two turning points, the BC series. And then right after the, the final losing streak, when they kind of just went on their big run. Yeah, those are, those are easily the, the uh, two turning points in the season. But I think, not so much a turning point for the season itself, but rather the whole program. 
this team really showed that uh, when it came to big games, they could come, they could compete, and they could give teams like uh, BU and UMass a run for their money. Uh, on senior night, of course, the, uh, UConn comes back in the last minute and a half, scores a goal. Kale Howarth and I believe Mark Catcomb in the last minute and a half come in, score, and uh, they grab the win on senior night. And honestly, that was probably my favorite game just because I, uh, I was working like three or four different jobs that night. It was crazy. But it, that's the kind of thing that this team can do. And they showed uh, throughout the season that they can do that. Uh, they were 4, 5, and 2 versus ranked opponents. And I think they even got some, some top 20 votes at some point throughout the season. So, yeah, I'd say this is this season was more a turning point for the program rather than, than anything. Yeah, Mike, I'm going to hop on that point as a turning point for the program. I think one of you guys are going to talk about this a little later in the podcast, but in years past, people would, t- other teams, you know, the BC, Northeastern, the top teams in the conference, perennial competitors for ch- national championships would look at UConn as sort of a, a cakewalk, you know, a, a cupcake game that they would come into Hartford, there'd be nobody at the XL Center, maybe four or 5,000 fans and in a huge building, it sounds like nobody and they'd walk all over the Huskies. But this year, like you said, four, five and two against ranked opponents for UConn, that's a significant improvement from years past and that's going to go a long way in terms of getting more fans into the building building that energy up having the team play with more of a purpose from the start of every single game from the start of every every single season going forward now we're going to talk about going forward a little bit later but for right now we're going to hop into some hypotheticals so season cut short right before the hockey east tournament was supposed to supposed to begin huskies were going to head up to maine one of the toughest plays to play places to play in hockey East play. I'm going to ask each of you guys, uh, Daniel, I'll start with you first. How far would this team have gone in the postseason? Uh, I think they could have won the tournament. Obviously it's not like, uh, it would have been really tough because that when you looked at the hockey East this year, it was kind of BC and then everybody else. So, uh, and, and the way, the way the final seedings were barring a, a crate and an upset, um, UConn would have faced BC in the semifinals. Now that, 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 that wouldn't have been a three game series. And, you know, hockey's one of those weird sports where really anybody could win, you know, you, you get a lucky bounce here or there, you know, you can just win a two, one game, you know, against anybody. So they definitely could have, it would have been tough to beat BC, but I think the most important thing about this team is they weren't, they weren't afraid of playing BC. They were, they weren't, they weren't afraid of um, playing any team. They could have beat, I think they had the mentality that they could have beat anybody they faced because they had knocked off ranked opponents all season, UMass, BU, UMass Lowell. Um, so I, I think um, I think they could have won it all. Obviously, we'll, we'll never know. You know, how, Who knows if they even would have gotten out of the first round having to go to Maine. That would have been real tough. But um, I, I do think that this team had the potential to go on uh, a crazy run. They were hot at the right time. And, uh, yeah. I could I could have seen them win it all. It would have been obviously very tough. It was BC's tournament to lose, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. But personally, I I, I can't see anybody getting anybody getting past that BC team. Uh, they were absolutely insane. Of course, they beat them earlier in the year. Aggregate eleven to one across two games. Just they just got absolutely murdered by BC. They used it as a jumping off point for the rest of the season, kind of harped on it the rest of the season in, uh, in post game pressers. But that, I, I don't think they could have gotten over that team. Uh, BC had scored 93 goals in conference. Uh, the next closest, or UConn was third with 71 goals. That's that's a 22 gap, or goal gap. That's just that's insurmountable. And UConn's defense, it's, it would, they were young. Yeah, they had some seniors, but overall they were uh, pretty much made up of freshmen. I, it, it would have just been a real tough look to, to see them making it past BC in the semifinal if BC was there. So I'm going to say, uh, I'd say semifinal was probably their cap, yeah. Now it's interesting to note that early in the season, or not early in the season actually, but uh, about midway through the season, Huskies went up to Maine. It was middle of February, February 14th the exact date, and they won 3-2 to two in Maine. And that was Maine's first home loss of the season. Came back the next night, played really a solid game all the way through regulation, ended up losing one to nothing in overtime. So they nearly came away with a four-point sweep at Maine. Um, so if they had 
you know, if the series had played out at Maine, nobody would have counted UConn out for sure. But like you guys said, if they had to match up against BC in the semifinals, would have been at the TD Garden. Neither of you mentioned the fact that that's basically home for BC. Mike, I'm going to hop to you in a second, but if they have matched up in that semifinal matchup, I mean, it would have been all BC fans at the Garden, would have been a raucous crowd, probably would have been a very tough matchup for the Huskies. Yeah, Mike, you got something to add? So, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, it, it, they're a young team. There was only, I think there was only like four or five upper class, or seniors, and uh, maybe a total of like eight uh, upper classmen in general. It's really hard for, you, you mentioned the, the crowd noise and the fans going to uh, TD Garden. It's pretty hard for uh, younger players to walk into a, an environment like that and just say, "All right, let's get down to business." It's not. It's not as easy as. And yes, you're you're a collegiate hockey player, and everything they're proud of where you go, but it's it's not as easy as, as you might think. And I think that's an important piece. So that's, that's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But that's going to be something that this team luckily can build on going forward. You know, a lot of young guys this year, but that translates well, especially considering how well those young guys did uh, towards the end of the season. Danny, did you want to add something too? Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I don't think we give, um, you know, Ma- Maine wouldn't have been any cakewalk because they have, uh, their goalie was a uh, Hobie Baker finalist, um, Swayman, I think was his name. And he, he, he went off in that one to nothing game that you mentioned. I think he made something like 40 saves. Uh, yeah, like, 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 I think we're almost projecting like they, they yeah, they would, they could have gotten past Maine and then they would have stumbled into BC, but I, who knows? I mean, Maine, Maine was a really good, every team was good in hockey East this year. Like there was a, there was a point where every team was really, you know, neck and neck. So, I mean, like, like I said, I think that, that, uh, tournament in general just would have been any, anybody could have won it. That's the, that's the magic of postseason sports for sure any team can win any game in a tournament like this in a field that's as competitive as the hockey east you never know what could have happened and UConn was so close to having a home game in the postseason the Saturday of the UMass series they went on the road played a pretty good game had a chance to tie it late stumbled I think four to three and then the following week Friday night at UMass Lowell another opportunity and they quite frankly, just came out a little flat, ended up losing that one three to one. So that sent them on the road or what would have been on the road against Maine. Now, before we get to talking a little bit more about uh, Coach Cavanaugh, we want to take a moment to remind you that Gansett Wraps is still open for business. Gansett, located at 12 Royce Circle in stores, is offering curbside pickup as well as delivery service during their normal hours. Please consider supporting a local business during these hard times. For more information, head to www.gansettwraps.com, check them out on Facebook, or download the Gansett Wraps app. Now, our next topic on today's episode is Coach Kavanaugh. I want each of you guys to take a stab at assessing his performance this season, talk a little bit about working with him, talking to him post-game. Let's get a little bit more insight into him as a coach and as a person as best as you can. Daniel, go to you first. Uh, yeah, well, so he was um, he was great. You know, he was Hockey East uh, Coach of the Year finalist for a reason. He really he really did a good job with this team. You know, I, I think the the thing about Coach Cav is that he never got too high or too low throughout the whole season. You know, the the BC series. You know, he told it how it was. He was like, "We need to play better. Like this was not who we are. We we need to get better than this." And you know, even after a big win like BU or UMass. <clears throat> he was like, it's just another big win. For, it's just another win for our team. Like it, he, he kept everything in perspective. He had higher goals for the team. And I think that's important as a coach. You can't have a coach, you know, being, you know, all, you know, defeated after a, a bad loss and, you know, through the roof after a big win. So I think it was great, you know, how he told it, how it was. And um, I, I really, yeah, I enjoyed working with him this season. You know, he was uh He's really – he's funny, he's uh, sarcastic in, in press conferences. You know, he always throws a little uh, a little comment after a question. Like, uh, I remember, you know, one time I, it was like I was asking him something. Uh, I think it was after the, the BU game, and, you know, I was, I was building it up. I was like, you know, that's a four-point swing in, in, you know, like a minute of game time. And he, he just – he's like, he's like, you love that four-point swing thing, huh? You know, like just stuff like that. I – um. He he was real um he was real funny and I, I know um like he one time that uh 
Mike Anthony of the the Hartford Current was there. You know, they, they, the Current doesn't really cover the team very much. And he kind of threw a dig at that at, to start the press conference. He was like, you know, we knew Mike Anthony of the Current was in the uh, was it was in the crowd tonight. We didn't want to disappoint him. So and just, just stuff. Like that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was it was really funny, and like like it might turn like beat red, and you know, it was it, it, just stuff like that. Like he, he was it, it, not not quite at uh, Gino Oriama level, but like his press conferences were were a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and I I think the team's in great shape with him at the helm. It's not easy going up against BC, BU, Northeastern with very inferior facilities in the same conference recruiting, but he's he's managed to do it and managed to build a team that can. Uh, can compete with those blue bloods of the conference. So I, I can't say enough. Coach Cav was great this season. Yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. One of my favorite things about Cav is uh, even on the, the days that they lose, which it isn't always to uh, easy to come out, lose, and then have to answer questions about it. He, uh, he never wavered. He, he told it exactly like it is. As Danny said, he, he always had reasons for what the, what they did wrong, what they could have done better. He was always honest. Uh, he's, he's just a funny guy. Uh, I know I personally like to ask questions about individual players, specifically uh, Carter Turnbull, the goat. And uh, he, for some reason, he kind of caught on to this. And anytime I asked an individual question, he just kind of snicker and then answer my question. It's just something that, that I appreciate. Uh, but from a from a coaching standpoint, uh, he's he's level headed. He's consistent. He, his focus isn't so much. Uh, what you can do with the puck, but rather how you do it. Uh, the effort, uh, the, the lunch pill uh, type mindset that he talks about, some of his players having, you do the work, you give your best effort. It's better than being cutesy and trying to do spins and uh, behind the back passes and things like that. If, if you do the job and you do the job well, you're going to have a spot on this hockey team. And that's that's a it's an important thing to have as a player to know that your, your coach is going to have your back as long as you are. Put the effort here, the results are 100% there. So something I think that's cool that you guys both sort of hinted at is that not many people cover the team. And you guys were there for a majority of the home games, and you really got to know Coach on not just a hockey level, but a bit of a personal level as well. Can you guys each just talk briefly about you know what it's like being a student reporter for a team and working directly with the student athletes and really getting to ask you know, a question per press conference if you if you want to, which is pretty different than maybe a basketball game at UConn where there could potentially be national media and there's certainly a lot of media from the Hartford area as well. Uh, Mike, I'll go to you on this for any thoughts on just being a student reporter for the hockey team. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think generally it, it's easier than you think. Uh, when the first day I know I stepped into the, the locker room, of course, I was scared. It was a new team. Uh, I'm just a sophomore, so I, I have some experience, but not as, as much experience as uh, what a senior would have. So I was a little nervous. And from day one, Cav, oh, he just looks you in the eye. He shakes your hand. Uh, he answers your question honestly. He doesn't disrespect you. He treats you like an adult because you are. And uh, he gives you the same platform as everybody else does. And I, that's the same thing with the athletes, too. Uh, coming into journalism, I always thought of like the Russell Westbrooks, where they'll they'll answer your question sometimes, but they'll kind of blow you off other times. This UConn hockey team isn't like that. They'll they'll respectfully listen to you. They'll uh, consider your question, even take some time to, to think of a response and, and give you a, a, a well thought out response. Especially guys like Ben Freeman uh, and Wyatt Newpower, the captains, will, will give you a, a really solid answer to what you uh, your question. Respect you at the same time, which I, which I really appreciate. Yeah, no, no, you you hit that on the head, um, Mike. Yeah, I I feel like the hockey beat is almost like the uh, the best of both worlds because it's a really good team in a really high profile like conference. Like the, the hockey East is the best college hockey conference in the uh, in the country, and you know they, they actually they were competing. They were they were in the running to you know be a top three seed in that so so they're a high they're a pretty high profile team but they don't get high profile coverage so uh, which is a shame because they, they definitely should but it actually made it nice for us as the beat writers because you know we um 
you know, we're covering a really good team, but we know actually the players, you know, and then the coach is answering our questions. We're the ones asking most of the questions because, you know, there, there's a few, you know, obviously the UConn blog covers them. There's a few other sites and, you know, rotating people around that will, uh, that will show up at the games. But, you know, we're the ones that were covering it from the beginning. And I think coach respected that. The players certainly appreciated it. And it was just nice, you know, because it's rare. Like, like you said, basketball, there's a lot of national attention, so they don't necessarily care about the Daily Campus or, uh, or UCTV. But, um, but for hockey, they really did, and they deserved it. Well, kudos to you guys. I know it's kind of a pain in the butt to get to Hartford on those Friday night games, Saturday afternoon games. But the work you guys put in, it, it shows. You guys know the team well. They respect you. Coach Cat looks in the eye, he shakes your hand, he answers your questions thoughtfully, and that's because of the work ethic that you guys put in. And it really, it's going to go a long way in not only your careers as UConn students, but your careers as professionals after that. So looking forward to what's next for both of you guys. As for what's next on our episode today, we're going to move into some individual awards, starting with your most surprising player this season. Danny? I feel I feel like it has to be um, Carter Turnbull. I don't I don't know if anybody expected the uh, the type of season he had. Twelve goals, uh, twelve assists, tied for the team lead in, in goals. He he really just burst onto the scene. There was a period during the season where he uh, I think he scored in like four or five straight games. It was just like wow. He he and he had he he had, he had some of the flashier goals of the season too. He's a real talented kid, and yeah. Uh, he created, uh, thanks to Mike, sort of a, a cult following among the, the beat writers. You know, anytime he did anything, we got a little extra hyped because uh, Carter Turnbull, he, he just continued to uh, <laughs> continue this solid season all, uh, all season long. So, Yeah, Carter Turnbull picked it from. Uh, he's easily my number, my, uh, my pick for this. Uh, he is, uh, even just outside the stats, you know, he led the team in goals. You just watch him on the ice. He attracts your eye. He is the one blazing up and down the ice when seemingly no one else is gonna is putting that effort in. If there's a loose puck deep in their in their zone, uh, he's got four guys behind him and he's sprinting directly at the goalie trying to pick off that puck and uh, make something happen. He uh, he's just he's just a different kind of guy. He's only five foot seven. Uh, last year he actually had his he broke his ankle uh, toward the end of the year. He was, they thought he was, uh, had a sprained ankle, but it was actually fractured. So uh, that kind of points to the, the lack of production uh, the year before. But yeah, I actually have some uh, Carter Turnbull content coming soon, so keep your eyes out on the daily campus for a, a potential feature there. That's great, and uh, must be pretty clear cut if you guys were on the same page there. Now, next individual award goes to the most improved player this season. We're going to switch it up. Mike, going to start with you this time. All right. Uh, so for me, it's uh, it's Mark Gatko, sophomore out of Woburn. Or Woburn. Uh, he only had one point his freshman year, had a negative 10 plus minus. But this year he really turned it on. Uh, 12 points on the year. He uh, had seven goals, five assists if, uh, off the top of my head. He, but from uh, freshman to sophomore year, freshman year he only took 34 shots all of his freshman year. Scored one goal, no assists, just one point. And then sophomore year doubles his shot totals, but he has 12 points. He completely ramped up his production. He, he was there in the big spots when they needed him. Uh, and he finished with a plus one in the year. I think he, he was just a really strong player, through, and uh, he really brought it for the, for the season, which I, I thought was good. Uh, yeah, and no, I, I, um, I could definitely see that he was. Um... Gatcom was good. I, I took a little different approach on this one. I'm going with Ben Freeman. Not necessarily like if you look at the stats from last year to this year, he actually had the same number of goals. He he had a lot more assists this year, but he he self admitted that last year was not what he could accomplish, not what what he wanted to accomplish. So he came in with um, higher expectations for himself, and he really he went from just being a contributor on the team to really being the guy. Like he he. Toward the end of the season, especially, like it was his line, him, uh, Sasha Payusov, uh, Carter, that were seemingly getting, you know, so many big goals every game. And uh, he, yeah, he turned into the probably the top player on the team, honestly, led the team in points. He always made the right play, the smart play. 
uh, just in that BU game, like, you know, the last two goals, he made two of the best plays of the season within a minute of each other. You know, he put himself in the right position to get a rebound to tie the game. And then he steals the puck in the opposing team zone, finds Sasha wide open, streaking to the net and just plays like that. Like he wasn't making those plays last year. So I really think, um, yeah, I really think it was uh, it was Ben Freeman uh, for, for me. Now we're going to move away from individual awards to actually a little bit of a team critique. So each of you guys are going to be tasked with telling me what this team needs to improve on next year. Danny, I'll go to you first. Uh, for me, I think they need to be uh, more consistent throughout the game. So like they, they, uh, they can't just turn it on for a period, you know, like they, they went through times where, you know, they were had a great first period, just, fell asleep in the second and then came back with a strong, you know, last 10 minutes of the third. I think they have to be on top of their game, the whole game and, and, and the whole season, uh, you know, just be a little bit more consistent day uh, throughout games. And also uh, Tomasz Vomashka has to be, has to be better. He, he got, he got masked, um, uh, masked a little bit this year by how good the offense was performing, but he let up over three goals a game. Uh, save percentage was under 900. He kind of took a step back from his strong freshman year. And, uh, you know, he, he made some great saves, but he also didn't make, you know, some some easier saves. So I uh, I think that's the, the two things for me. They um, Tomas has to has to be a little bit more consistent and the team as a whole has to uh, has to perform more on a consistent basis throughout a game. Yeah, uh, I'm going to add Tomas, no matter – the offensive, offense or defense did. He was a lock for giving up three plus goals a game. And it wasn't like he was giving up five here, one there. No, it was three to four goals a game. And you could pretty much uh, write it in before uh, the puck dropped. But uh, personally, I'd say they really need to figure out their special teams. They really struggled with, uh, with their, their power play and their penalty kill. They uh, only scored on 13% of their, their power plays this year when they were giving up uh, nearly or uh, 28%. So they, you, that's just, it's too big of a margin. You gotta, you gotta clamp that down. That'll, that'll, their defense will improve as their defenders age. They had a lot of freshmen, sophomores, as I've mentioned, and they just, they need to uh, stop passing the, the puck around so much on, on the offensive end. Uh, me and some of the other big players, we got the blast, because you could just count the, the amount of passes and it was a lock for eight plus passes on a, on a power play attempt. It was, at times difficult to watch because uh, especially like the BU or BC games, the, the bigger opponents, the second they got a, a, a power play, you knew that they were going to give up a goal. And the second UConn got a penalty or UConn got a power play, they, they, you knew they were going to uh, skate around for two minutes. So uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely something they need to look to change in the, in the coming year. And I think that'll get better as they, they grow and uh, they're, they're an older team. Yeah. That's funny about the power plays. I think a lot of the games that I went to, every time they were on the power play, it was like pass to the point, pass to the blue line, pass down to the goal line, pass back up. And you could just hear the crowd, shoot, shoot, shoot. And it was just, it was agonizingly frustrating because with so much talent on that offense, you just wanted them to put the puck on net. It's like a hockey cliche. When you put the puck on the net, good things happen. And something they're going to need to do next year to improve on, I know a little bit, of a down year for Vomashka as well, but hopefully with the defense getting a little bit more mature, a little bit more experienced, he'll have a season a little bit more in line with that freshman year than his sophomore year. Now, this segment is my most, my, my favorite segment of the podcast. It's our rapid fire section and I'm going to challenge you guys and require you guys actually to keep these answers to a sentence or less. So first up, Danny, First, and then Mike, right after your team MVP. Uh, tough not to say Ben, but I, I'm I'm gonna go uh, Wyatt Newpower. He's the emotional leader on and off the ice. When he's on the ice, great things happen. Wyatt Newpower. Yeah, I'm gonna agree. Uh, I want to say Carter, but it's got to be Wyatt. No. I know I'm going to break my own rule about this rapid fire segment, but Danny, you broke some news about Wyatt New Power last night. Want to share that? Oh yeah, um, yeah. Wyatt actually, um, he let me know last night. Um, I, I I did um, a story 
Uh, well, I, I interviewed all the seniors uh, for, for a story I was doing and, you know, asked them about their future and stuff. And he, he didn't know, like he said, he wanted to, you know, he's, he's definitely playing professionally, but he didn't have, have anything specific yet. Then he, he emailed me last night and uh, yeah, and he let me know that he signed with the Columbus Blue Jackets organization and he will be reporting to the AHL affiliate, which is in Cleveland uh, next season. So that's, that's obviously huge for him. Uh, congratulations to Wyatt. Um, I wish him not, uh, nothing but the best. He really had a fantastic season this year. Now, Danny, not only does he serve as double agent for UCTV and Daily Campus, but he also writes for UConn Athletics. So make sure to head to UConnHuskies.com, see a lot of Danny's really great work, a lot of pieces on individual athletes there, telling their stories, not just on the field, the court, or the ice, but outside of it as well. Next rapid-fire topic is going to go to Mike first. It's the best goal you saw this season. Yeah, it's got to be uh, Kale Howarth against UMass uh, with eight seconds to go. Easily not the prettiest, but uh, the best and most important for the team, I think. Yeah, I, I tried to go with the, the most uh, visually pleasing one, and um, it was uh, Carter uh, in the BU game. It was the first goal. He kind of fell down in the corner and and somehow got to his feet. He was like double covered and went like around the goalie and just stuffed the puck in. It was it was really really a nice goal. Next one, Danny. First, best uniform this team wears. I like the the road blues the best, but the gradient alternate homes for this year are not bad. Dan Connolly, they are not that bad. He Danny, I have to, yeah, I have to agree with you on that. I think they're pretty clean. Not gonna lie. I uh, I don't love the gradients. I thought they were really cool at first, and then and as a, and I, when I saw them in person, it was it was rough. I'm gonna go the home whites. They're clean. Got brainwashed by Dan there, Mike. Come on, <laughs> Mike. Um, back to you on this one. Uh, best game you saw this year? Uh, easily the 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 BU game. Uh, for personal reasons and because it was the most exciting, I think, because uh, I was so busy that day. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, the the BU game for sure. Um, you know, the comeback, last second goal, and then winning it right away in overtime. That was, uh, yeah, that was that was that was definitely the that was the win of the year. Yeah, BU was electric. Then the next day they went up to a Gannis Arena and just blew the doors off the Terrier six one, and that was like, wow, this team's for real. But uh, that Friday night BU game, I was sitting all the way up in the rafters shadowing Adam Giardino, who was doing the game for the radio. That game was sweet. But I got to say, the UMass game the following Friday, senior night, was much better. I don't. I thought that was the obvious choice. When they scored that goal with eight seconds to go, Kale Howarth, place was as loud as it was for like the Memphis basketball game against the men. Um, I thought the UMass game was the best game of the season. It seems like every year they beat a top 10 UMass team, though. Danny, you want to argue that one? Uh, no, no, no. I, I I could definitely see that. The the reason I, I like obviously you can't go wrong with it. The reason I picked the the first one is because you know since it had just happened a week earlier, you know I almost had the hope as I'm or you know thought in the back of my head. I'm like you know they did this last week, they might be able to do it again. Whereas like the week before, it completely blindsided me because they were playing like crap for like 37 minutes of game time. So uh, that, that, that was the reason I picked BU, but you, you can't go wrong with either one. All right. I respect that. I respect that. All right. Now this one, I know you guys aren't expected for. Grandma's cookies, yay or nay? Danny, you first. Uh, middle. I, I don't love them, but I don't hate them. They're, they're, uh, I, I always say that my, my reaction to this is the, the, uh, the Jim Calhoun. They're not bad. That's, that's <laughs> yes. uh, Personally, they're fine. They get the job done. They, uh, my, my biggest problem with them is the dough. When you really think about it, it tastes exactly like the dough in Fig Newtons, just a little bit more hydrated. Oh, my God. That is dangerously it's a, true. And it just changes right. the game for you, mindset-wise. So they do the job, but they're not ideal. That's what, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah, not as good as the food as the at the rent. Uh, the Rentschler Field food, easily best food at UConn Media events. Now, last topic. Yeah, Danny, you agree with that one? Definitely, definitely, by far. Yeah, they got Chick-fil-A, Bears barbecue, uh, all sorts of stuff. I cannot wait for football season for that reason and pretty much that reason only. Now, last topic. <laughs> last topic today, 
what is this team's legacy? When we look back on this 2019-2020 team in five or ten years, how will we remember them? Danny, you first. Uh, I think this team will um, definitely be remembered for changing the standard of, uh, of UConn hockey. They're no longer, you know, a bottom dweller, you know, the, the punching bags for the, for, the, for the big guns, you know, BC, uh, Northeastern. Uh, you know, they, 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 didn't, they didn't have a chance to cement that legacy, which would have been, you know, if they went on a run, you know, all the way to the championship game or even possibly winning it, that would have really cemented that. But it was still a special team that I think will we'll be looked back at uh, fondly in UConn hockey history for what they were able to accomplish in, uh, in the shortened season. Yeah, I feel like this might be the team that never was. Uh, this, this team didn't necessarily get robbed. Uh, of course, they got robbed of their, their postseason, but I don't think they would have gone s- super far. But just the, the general idea of we didn't get the chance to complete it. Uh, I, me and some uh, other Daily Campus uh, writers, we were in, um, uh, what's it called? The pizza place, Blaze. Uh, we were in Blaze the, the night that everything got canceled and we saw just some, some players and they weren't, they weren't looking too uh, happy. Uh, to say the least, I won't go into that too much. But yeah, I, w- I would say this team, their, their legacy really boils down to not having the chance to finish their season like every other athlete out there. And uh, showing that the effort wins wins games. Uh, when they showed up, when they put in put their best foot forward, they won. And there was nothing you could do about it as an opponent. And they showed uh, other teams that you can't just walk into Hartford and and waltz out easily like you may have been able to in the past. Uh, this this team could be, as I mentioned before, a turning point for the rest of the program. Well, Mike, Danny, thank you so much for joining me for today's episode, episode four. So it was a lot of fun. This men's hockey team was great this year. I mean, struggled early, came together, a lot of great plays, a lot of really memorable moments. And the best thing is that the best is still yet to come under head coach Mike Kavanaugh. Next episode, I'll be joined by Ty Reeves and Grant Mengel, two women's basketball practice players, and they'll be talking life as a UConn women's basketball player, UConn women's basketball practice player, excuse me. They'll tell some good stories about Chris Daly, maybe some tales of Gino and his antics during practice, and a whole lot more. So, Stick around for that. That'll be coming later this week. That'll be episode five, Ty Reeves and Grant Mengel. Mike, Danny, thank you again one more time. Be safe, be healthy, take care of yourself, take care of your families, and we'll talk soon. But in the meantime, I'm Noah Mott. Thanks for tuning in to the Students of Stories podcast. Have a terrific evening, everybody.